Hello, Shady Rest family, and welcome to Church Online this week. Just a couple notes before we go ahead and get into today's message. Our online Zoom Bible studies have begun, and we'd love for you to be able to join us if you haven't had the opportunity to yet. All the information that you need to be able to jump on into these groups is located in the description of this actual video. If you have any questions, let us know. Secondly, let's talk a little bit about giving because we still want to worship the Lord through giving when we have the opportunity during this time, as rough as it may be. So if you want to give, there's one of three ways that you could be able to do that. You can mail your check into the church office, you can give online via our website, or you can give via text. And all that information will be listed in the description of this video. So as we get into today's message, if you want to open your Bible with us, we're going to be in Joshua chapter 4, and I've entitled today's message, Build an Altar. And we're going to talk about the significance of altars and what it means for us today. So God bless you as you take a listen to this message. Hey guys, welcome to Church Online this week. We miss you guys so much and we pray that your family is doing well and that you're staying safe during this crazy time that we find ourselves living in. Remember that this message is pre-recorded, so I am in the chat with you. I'd love for you to be able to interact during the message. I'd love to be able to have you guys submit prayer requests. And that way we can just kind of uh, touch base in that way. I want to go ahead and begin by praying. So let's go ahead and start with a word of prayer before we get into today's message. So Lord, we do pray that you will help us that to be able to connect with you today. Lord, there are so many things that are distracting us right now with so many different fears and worries and just things that are clouding our minds with going on in our worlds right now, our personal worlds and in our world in general. I pray that just for this short time together, that we'll be able to drown out those things and be able to hear your still small voice in the midst of all the noise. Pray that you would give us ears to hear, give us a heart to receive, what you'd like to encourage us with and challenge us with through your word today. And may we be willing recipients. In Jesus' name, amen. Those of you who want to follow along in the U version, we have created a U version event for today, so go ahead and follow along if you'd like to in your electronic device in that way. I've entitled today's message. Build an altar out of Joshua chapter 4. And we'll talk a little bit about that significance throughout the duration of this message. One of my favorite places to visit in the United States is Washington, D.C. Now, how many of you have been to D.C.? Hit a thumbs up in the comments right now if you've been to Washington, D.C. And also put in the comments, what is your favorite memorial to visit in Washington, D.C.? Because likely if you have been to D.C., you have been there, so that way you can visit some of the awesome monuments and memorials that are around our nation's capital. There, these memorials have been created specifically to cause us to remember about certain people and certain events that have happened throughout the duration of our history. Thousands upon thousands of people every year descend upon our nation's capital to be able to visit things like the Lincoln Memorial, the Washington Monument, the Jefferson Memorial, and so on and so forth. Have you ever thought about what the purpose of a memorial is? The purpose of a memorial is to remind people of a specific person or a specific event. Now, one of my favorite memorials to visit is the Lincoln Memorial. Now, when you visit the Lincoln Memorial, especially when you see him sitting on that big throne, and as large as he is, there's no way that you cannot think about our 16th president. You think about things like the Emancipation Proclamation come to mind. You think about how he led us through the Civil War. You think about also things like his assassination, all these different events that are strategically linked to the life of this, the, the life of this larger than life figure in our American history. Have you ever noticed the words that are inscribed in the Lincoln Memorial? Here's what they read. It says, in this temple, as in the hearts of the people whom he saved, the Union, the memory of Abraham Lincoln is enshrined forever. This is the words actually in the Lincoln Memorial. So when I think about and all these different events that identify so closely with President Lincoln's life, we go to this, space, this sacred kind of space to be able to purposely remember and to honor him for all that he has done and what he has meant to our country. In the Old Testament, we hear a lot about altars. Altars were places of worship where sacrifice was made, but altars were also built as memorials. And we're going to talk about it from that standpoint, as we will see in our story today in Joshua chapter 4. 
An altar was a structure which was built upon for sacrifices to be made for religious purposes. An altar was always a place of sacrifice and consecration, but there were also times when God himself commanded his people to build altars after he delivered them in some miraculous way so they would serve as memorials for literally generations to proceed after. Much like generations after our visiting the Lincoln Memorial or remembering those events, it was the same thing for the Israelites. They would build altars that God told them to so that they could commemorate their history and stories can be told of God's faithfulness literally for generations. They were word pictures. They were illustrations used as teachable things for the people to teach about their history. In our story today, the people of Israel have just crossed over the Jordan on dry ground, and they finally reached the edges of the promised land they had been promised to enter into so many years before. And the very first thing that they do, that God tells them to do, as they set foot on dry land, he told them to take stones from the Jordan River and to erect an altar as a memorial. So here's my one true statement for you today. And what I believe is the purpose of these memorials and these altars that God had his people create is we are to remember what God has done to strengthen your faith for what is to come. Let me say that again. We are to remember what God has done to strengthen your faith for what is to come. God will often have us look back to our past to be able to see and remember his faithfulness because that will encourage us in our present and onto the future when circumstances get dire. Because our God does not change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I'm so grateful for that reality. So today I want to talk about building memorials. I want to talk about building altars. And I want to link it to the current context and the situation and crisis that we find ourselves in today. So as I mentioned before, our text this morning is found in Joshua chapter 4. So if you want to turn there, or if you want to go ahead and follow along in your electronic device, we're going to find ourselves in Joshua chapter 4. And there's two things I just want to share with you briefly about altars from this passage. Let me go in and set the stage for you, okay? So in Joshua chapter 3, we are told that the Jordan River is overflowing so much that it is dangerous for the people of Israel and their livestock to go across. So God instructed Joshua, and he tells the priests to carry the Ark of the Covenant on their shoulders. Now, if you remember anything about the Ark of the Covenant, it was like this box, and there were rods that would go through that they would hold it on their shoulders. And they were to step out onto the water that's overflowing right now. Put yourself in this situation. And the moment that their foot touched the water, the water stopped flowing. Incredible story. The water just stops flowing, and they are able to go across on dry lands. It reminds you of what happened in Exodus when God parted the Red Sea. Here he is essentially parting and stopping the Jordan River, almost kind of like a full circle kind of remembrance generationally of his promise that he was going to bring them into this land. It was truly a miraculous work of God. And God wanted that work to be remembered forever, what he did at that point. So what did he do? He had the people build two altars to commemorate the event of what he had just done. And that's where we find ourselves picking up in Joshua chapter 4. So let me go ahead and start by just reading the first five verses to kind of set the stage for you. So Joshua chapter 4, starting at verse 1. When all the nation had finished passing over the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Take twelve men from the people, each tribe a man. Verse 3. And command them, saying, Take twelve stones from here out of the midst of the Jordan, from the very place where the priest's feet stood firmly, and bring them over with you, and lay them down in the place where you lodge tonight. Verse 4. Then Joshua called the twelve men from the people of Israel, whom he had appointed, a man from each tribe. And Joshua said to them, Pass on before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan, and take up each of you a stone upon his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the people of Israel. So here's the first thing I want you to see about altars, which we find starting in verse 6. Is number one, our altars are teaching tools. Let me say that again. Altars are teaching tools. Verse 6. That this may be a sign among you, 
when your, when your children ask in times to come, what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall tell them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it passed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall be to the people of Israel a memorial forever. So these stones were set up at a place called Gilgal, where they camped about, which was about two miles from Jericho. And it was the first territory that, Israelite, that the Israelites claimed in the promised land of Canaan. Now, these verses clearly tell us the reason why God had them set up these altars. They were set up as a sign, not only to serve as a sign, but also as a teaching instrument. Okay? He said, your children are going to ask about these, and generationally later, you'll be able to tell them about exactly the events that happened today. If you think about a sign for a moment, a sign is something that represents something else and it gives it meaning. The sign only has meaning when we see it in light of what it is supposed to represent. Let me give you a perfect example. For a Christian, a cross has a great significance. It's a sign. It's a symbol. It has significant meaning because what is it, it is attached to. Now, if you are a Roman in the first century and you saw a cross, a cross was just an instrument of death. It was your primary means of execution. It did not have significance and meaning. But for Christians, the day that Jesus died upon a cross, and he wasn't the only one to ever die upon a cross. As a matter of fact, when he died, there were two other people right alongside of him that were dying upon crosses. But the cross took on a brand new meaning when the Son of God was killed upon it. So now, generations later, when we look upon a cross, and even at our church on our stage, we have a cross on that back wall. When we look at it, we don't see it just as an instrument of death, but we see it where our Savior died for us, and we see the significance and meaning behind that symbol. So many of you may have crosses in your home, cross walls or crosses on display, and those things represent for us where our Savior died. Now people wear them on their necks, people tattoo them on their bodies when it comes to crosses, but only for a Christian can something so horrific also be seen as beautiful. We see it as beautiful because of what it meant, and because of who died upon it. We not only remember the cross by physically looking at a cross, or some representation of a cross, but as believers, we also actively remember the cross when we take communion. Every Sunday that we take communion together, we are actively remembering what Jesus died for us, what, how Jesus died for us, and we are recalling his sacrifice upon the cross. So communion is like an altar. It's a memorial. It is a way for us to actively remember an event that happened in history that is still having impact today. So we remember the past, the fact that Jesus actually died in time and space, but that strengthens our faith in the present and propels us to the future because of what it means. Now for Israel, these pile of rocks were much more than just a pile of rocks. Anybody walking by may have just said, that just looks like a pile of rocks. Or they may have just said, this looks like just any ordinary altar. But for Israel, they knew exactly what that meant. That meant that God brought them over the Jordan onto dry land, finally into the promised land. This was an object lesson to be used for generations to be able to teach children when they would ask their parents what these stones would mean. This was a culture that a lot of their history was passed orally. And so orally, they'd be able to tell the story of, I can remember the day I was a little kid when we walked across the Jordan and the waters dried up and God had us set up these stones as a memorial, as an altar, as a place of remembrance to remember all that God had done for us. As that relates to us today, there are moments in our life that we will never, ever forget. Think about it. Maybe for you, that's your wedding day, the birth of a child, graduating from school, the death of a loved one, etc. There are so many events in our own personal lives that we will never, ever forget. They will always mark our memory in our hearts. There are a few events, however, collectively worldwide that leave a resounding impact that people all across the world will never forget. The first event that comes into my mind, at least during my lifetime, is what happened at 9-11. I bet you still can remember what, where you were when you saw the news and you heard about the towers falling. 
I still remember that I was on my way to lunch in the Gordon Lindsay Tower at Christ for the Nations Institute when we saw the news and we saw everything that was transpiring in New York. I bet you still can put yourself where you were that day. Remember the emotions that you were feeling and remember maybe some of the phone calls that you had and just have very vivid memories of everything that was going on. Generations will never forget what happened that day and what happened as a result of that. What did we do so that the the memory of that would not pass away? Because if you think about that, that was in 2001 now. We are almost 20 years removed from that event and we still talk about it and memorialize it every single year. And what did the United States do? We built altars. We built memorials. If you've ever been to New York City and seen the ground zero kind of memorial, the 9-11 memorial, the two fountains, gorgeous, gorgeous memorial, very humbling to be there in that space. But we do that purposely so we cause ourselves to remember what happened. If you go outside the Pentagon, there's been a memorial that has been erected, this beautiful garden with these seated benches. And I'm going to put the photo on the screen for you so you can be able to see. We memorialized those events. I believe we are living in such a time like that. We will look back 10, 15 years from now, and we will say, remember the coronavirus outbreak in 2020, that it will forever mark our lives. It'll forever mark our lives because it's when the collective normal was thrown on its head and we were laid, you know, people were laid off of work and people were dying and this virus was spreading and all the chaos that we can remember and stimulus packages and all this other stuff. We will remember this because of the worldwide impact. It will forever mark our lives. We are living in that moment in history. And I'm sure that once we see the end of this situation, which I believe we will get to the other side, we will likely memorialize it. We will build some altar to it. We'll have something tangible that will cause people to be able to remember everything that happened. But there will also be a testimony. Just like those memorials serve not only as a place of solemn remembrance, but also a testimony of the ability to persevere and move forward. And so that's what I believe that is happening to us right now. We will get through this health crisis. We all will remember what happened. But I hope we also will remember that God is getting us through personally and collectively as a whole through a very dark time in history. This is a learning opportunity. I believe God is speaking very clearly to us during this time. And the question is, are we listening? This is an opportunity for us collectively to learn what's really important, to get back to the simplicity of life, to be able to get back to the simple nature of faith, to get back to the idea of loving our actual neighbor and caring for people, to be able to not, uh, to be able to love them in a way that God loves them. God is speaking, and I believe he always begins in his house first. I myself have just been praying a lot about everything that's been going on. I've been hearing so many different ministers, and, we, and I, I believe that collectively there is this, this kind of um, rumbling that's going on within the body of Christ saying that God is trying to wake us up, that God is using this situation to get us back to our first love that God is using this situation to be able to get us back to the simple nature of what it means to, to, to be in faith and to practice faith again, and to get us back to the reality that the church doesn't need a building, that we are the church, and that we can impact this world, and that he wants to use us for his glory. There's a lesson here for all of us as Christians. Just like these altars in Joshua served as an opportunity for generations to be able to tell their children, We have a responsibility as Christians to memorialize, to to create an altar in that, so to speak, to pass on faith to generations. It has always been the responsibility of God's people to pass down his message throughout the generations. We are responsible for that, to be able to pass on our faith, to be able to tell the story about what God has done collectively in history about telling the story about what God has done for us personally and using our personal story as well. So my question for you and for me is, what will be the story that we tell about the coronavirus situation in 2020, 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now? 
What is the story that we will tell? I hope when we speak and look back at this situation and talk about all the difficulties and the struggles, I hope that we also will tell a story of perseverance. I hope that we also will tell a story of how God's people, how the big C church, not individual churches, individual church kind of thing broke down and the big C church rised up and stepped up and started serving people and loving our neighbor like it's never been seen. That people were reached for the gospel in a way that has never been seen. That uh, God had uh, moved in such a way that genuine faith was coming out of place of desperation in people's lives. I hope that's the story that we will tell. And I believe that that's the story that God is working in our hearts right now. So the first thing we saw, guys, is that altars are teaching tools. The second thing I want you to be able to see is jump down to verse 19. And the second thing is that altars are testimonies for the world. So altars are testimonies for the world. Look at verse 19. The people came up out of the Jordan on the 10th day of the first month, and they encamped at Gilgal on the east border of Jericho. And those 12 stones which they took out of the Jordan, Joshua set up at Gilgal. And he said to the people of Israel, When your children ask their fathers in times to come, what do these stones mean? Jump down to verse 22. Then you shall let your children know Israel passed over this Jordan on dry ground. Listen to this. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan for you until you passed over, as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up for us until we passed over, so that all the peoples of the earth, there it is, may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, that you may fear the Lord your God forever. I want to focus on verse 24, because Joshua gets to his point. Not only is it a teaching tool, but then he talks about how it's a testimony to the whole world. Joshua testifies because he had been one of those ones who had gone through the Red Sea, right? And then he talks about how that all the people of the earth may know that the Lord is mighty and that this physical representation would stand as a monument, an altar to that reality. It would speak to the significance of the God of Israel and his power and the worship of the people of Israel and their, their alliance upon their God. The people of Israel are finally about to walk into the promised land, but God is moving in their lives and he serves, it serves as a purpose and a witness to the greater world around them. And the same could be said for us. Israel was always considered and said to be the people of God. And they were supposed to represent what it meant for a people to worship the one true God to the worst of the world around them. Is that not what we are today as the church? As the church, we are part of the people of God. We have been engrafted into that people. We have been adopted as children. And so now we serve as a representation of him to the world at large as well and tell people to come and be part of God's family. If you think about this for a moment, baptism is a perfect picture of this. When we get baptized, it's an event where people invite other people, even those who do not believe in Christ to come to this event. And this event is a visual testimony of the goodness and greatness of God and God's saving ability. Baptism is a visual picture of something that has already happened, salvation, something that's happened internally, and it stands as a proclamation to everybody who's present that you who are being baptized, that you belong to Jesus. There was a pastor in Texas that I used to love who always used to say, that baptism is a sign that the devil's lost you and Jesus has won you. And I love that. This event, baptism, can be a conversation between those who do not know Jesus and that you can have by saying the significance of what Jesus has done in your life and what this actually represents that is happening before their very own eyes. So just like this altar stood as a visual representation for them not only to share with their generations, but a testimony to the whole world, we are literally a living billboard and witness for Jesus to the whole entire world around us. God is saving people, making them to be walking memorials for him. Let me say that again. God is saving people to be walking memorials for him. That's the reason why God saves us. God doesn't just save us just so we can go to heaven. 
God saves us so that way we can be his hands and feet on this earth so that Jesus can work in us and work through us. And so we could be literally walking billboards, talking and communicating about his greatness, telling the whole world. If you have had your life changed by Jesus, then you are that walking billboard. There are events that have been taking place in your life that have brought you to the place where you finally give your life to Christ. These are memorial, altar kind of building events. If you could think back on your life now, you could think of how God was moving, even in the background, setting up all the things that were necessary, putting strategic relationships in your life, making providential circumstances in your life, all these things working to bring you to the place where you will finally receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. All of these different events that have transpired, serve as a testimony to the world around us. And now that our lives have been transformed by Jesus, we serve as living testimonies about the greatness and the power of our God. That's why I always say that the greatest story we can ever share in line with the gospel is our own personal story, our own testimony, because nobody can argue with what Jesus has done in your life. People could try to argue about the Bible all that they want until they're blue in the face, but they cannot argue about how you once were lost, but now you are found. You were blind, but now you were see. Now you see. And I've been reading through the Gospels. I'm reading through the Gospel of John right now. And it's amazing when I see people who Jesus miraculously healed in the simple nature of their faith. They say that I was blind, but now I see. Uh, I was deaf, but now I hear. I read today where, it ta- where uh, Jesus healed a layman and told him to pick up his mat. And he told the religious leaders, and he just said, This man healed me and he told me to pick up my mat. And as simple as that was, he told a story about the greatness of what Jesus was doing. Here's the point. The world is looking to you and I as the church. The world is looking at us right now. The world is always looking at us. Paul says that we are living epistles to be read before men. But the world is like, it's like hypersensitive, like looking at us right now. Because we have this strategic opportunity In the midst of chaos, people tend to actually reach out to God. And so the world is looking at us. How are we going to respond, church? How are we going to be the church? How are we going to be able to love people well and be a voice of hope in the midst of this crisis? How can we be a voice of faith in the midst of this crisis? A tangible expression of Jesus to those who are in need around us. This is a divine moment in history. We can either see it as a challenge or we can see it as an opportunity. We can see it as a challenge or we can see it as an opportunity. This crisis is causing the church to leave the building. You and I, we are the church. We belong to Jesus. And this world so desperately needs you and I right now. They don't need just, they they don't need another lecture. They don't need, what they need right now is they need your heart. They need your hands. They need your prayers. They need everything. They just need a tangible expression of Jesus is what they need right now. Because remember, altars are testimonies for the world. But here's the funny thing is that you and I, Scripture calls us the temple of the Holy Spirit in Corinthians. So you and I, a temple was a place where in the Old Testament and even in the, the times of the New Testament, When they had the temple, inside the temple was places for sacrifice. Altars were there. So you are a living temple. You are a walking billboard for people to see Jesus. And the world so desperately needs you right now. The church has always been and will always be a testimony to the reality of God and his character. Let me say that again. The church has always been and will always be a testimony to the reality of God and his character. The greatest evidence that God in heaven exists is you and I, changed lives by the gospel. But not only will we be a reflection of saying that there is a God in heaven who is still in control, who has still made a way for us, who's made provision for us, who cares for us, who loves us, all of those things, but we are also a representation of that character, of the nature of who he is because we were created in his image, that we would have his heart. And God, I want God's heart, and I hope that you want God's heart as well. So let me summarize this for you today. Is number one, 
our one true statement was that remember what God has done to strengthen your faith for what is to come. Let me say that again. Remember what God has done to strengthen your faith for what is to come. The whole purpose of these altars and these memorials was to reflect on the past that would also speak forward into and speak life about the faithfulness and character of God into the future. God will often remind us about the faithfulness of him in the past, in our past, purposely, so that way when we question his faithfulness, we can remember his unchanging character. God is going to remind us. He's so good in doing that. I told you two things about altars today. Number one is that altars are teaching tools. They were conversation pieces between generations. And they were a place where the history could be spoken of, but then also could be communicated in the present. And so they were teaching tools, but they also were testimonies to the world. These altars that stood erect would also testify to the goodness of the God of Israel. And so we are like those altars now, walking billboards and testimonies to the world for people to see our God working in us and working through us. So how can you put this into practice today? Well, my encouragement to you to put this into practice is, I want you to think about if you are a believer here listening to this message, what are those strategic times in your life that what I would call altar building moments? What are those times in your life that shaped you, that you recognize now that God was using those situations and circumstances, those, those relationships in order to bring yourself to him? Where have been the times in your past where you have seen God to prove himself to be faithful that can serve you as a means of encouragement today if you question his faithfulness today? We recall these moments not only just to remember, but I believe we also recall these moments to cultivate praise. When we think about the faithfulness of God, it should cultivate praise to God from within us and encourages us toward the future. So think about those strategic moments in your life. Here's what I would encourage you to do with them. Number one, write them down. Write them down. Because the biggest thing our enemy would love to do during this time is to create a sense of hopelessness, to create a sense of distance and isolation, a sense of anxiety in your heart. And he would love for you to think about, especially if you're finding yourself in a very difficult situation right now, you might have just lost your job. You might know somebody who's sick all of those different things. What he would love to do right now is for you to question the faithfulness of God. Where's your God now in this situation? Where is he? He would love for you to be able to do that. But actively remember the fact and speak the truth to that reality. And remember that my God is faithful and write those things down and remember where you have seen the faithfulness of God in your life. Let it be an encouragement to you today to propel you to the future, to push you forward during these times. Thank God. Not only write them down, but use them as a means to then usher out praise from your mouth, to thank God for his goodness, for his faithfulness. Use it as a vehicle to help you to push through with praise. And then lastly, let that be fuel to fuel your faith going forward, okay? I can't tell you the countless amount of times when I've been in difficult situations and God is reminding me because I find myself in the same kind of state of where emotionally I feel the same way that I did previously in a very similar scenario or in the same exact scenario. And then God is saying, remember how I was faithful here. Remember how I saw you through this situation. Remember how I loved you through this situation. Remember how I provided for you through this situation. So I thank God, and then that fuels me to remember, because I have to speak truth to myself, and you have to speak truth to yourself, that our God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if you truly believe that truth, then let that reality of his faithfulness fuel you to be able to go forward, even in the midst of uncertainty and seeming crisis and chaos all around us. Well, I hope that this message was an encouragement to you today. Let's build some altars, guys. Let's go in and remember the faithfulness of God and remember that our God, he's still on the throne. He is still watching over us and he is still with us. I want to go in and pray our blessing over you. And my apologies for forgetting to do that last week. But I want to go in and pray our blessing that we close out every Sunday with. And I feel like it's very strategic to be able to pray this right now 
and just pray these words over you. So wherever you're at right now, I want to go ahead and just ask you to close your eyes. And what I want you to do is just set your hands out in front of you like you are receiving from God and that you would receive this blessing over you and your family today. Now go into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Honor all men. Strengthen the faint-hearted and support the weak. Help the suffering and share the gospel. Love and serve the Lord and the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you until we see each other again. God bless you guys. I love you so much. We miss you. Know that we are here for you. We'd love to hear from you if you have any personal needs or anything like that. Let us know how we can serve you during this difficult time. We will talk soon.